everyone. I'd like to welcome you to Forest Herd North Carolina's Conservation in Practice. Uh, this will be our third uh, webinar in a year long series on conservation in North Carolina. So welcome, uh, thank you for joining us today, taking a few minutes out of your day to uh, talk about conservation in North Carolina and more particularly, what does that mean or what does that look like on the ground or in practice? Uh, we've got a great group of speakers lined up for you today. We're excited to bring this to you today. And, uh, and hopefully you will find um, several things that you can take away and maybe uh, think about or look at for your personal property. So just a few things. Um, this webinar is being recorded. So if you uh, have to step away or maybe you feel like you wanna review something and maybe you wanted to take a few more notes, this webinar will be recorded and it will be available on our webpage at www.forestherrnc.org. So um, just give us a week or two, but this, video, this webinar will be recorded. All right, so I always forget, um, my name is Jennifer Johnson Roach. I am a district forester with the North Carolina Forest Service. So uh, glad to be here with you today. All right, so just a few things as we get started. A few, uh, we know that folks are doing a lot of virtual meetings now, Zoom meetings, team meetings, webinars, but we do want to make sure that everyone out there does have the opportunity or knows how to connect with us. Um, it's, it's very hard to, <laughs> to connect with folks via a computer sometimes. So we just wanna make sure that everyone is comfortable in uh, being able to share or ask those questions. Um, all right, so our chat box is our friend. So usually when you're, if you're on a computer, your chat box is at the bottom. Um, you can click on that box, you can type in your question, or if you have comments that are related to what the speaker is, is talking about, uh, feel free to type those in as we go. Uh, let's see, we don't have anything in there yet. But, um, um, but all the information you can put in the chat box. Uh, we do have an interactive activity that we'll go into in a little bit as well. And so information that we have for you, we will also be sharing in that chat box. So we'll have a few links or a few websites and we'll share that information to you as well in that chat box. Bob, did I, did I leave anything out? Nope, you're good. Okay, so that's Bob Barden. He's our, our behind the scenes guru that is uh, helping us make sure that we can bring this webinar into your, into your home or your business. All right. Okay, so let's just take a few minutes uh, to kind of talk about where we are. Where is Forest Herder right now? What, what's going on and what we got planned? Uh, so uh, this year, uh, we did have a webinar series. So we have four webinars planned. Uh, two of those we have already done. So webinar one and webinar two, uh, where we uh, talked about conservation in North Carolina, um, or excuse me, a conversation on conservation and how your land matters. Those were the first two webinar series in webinars in the series of conservation in North Carolina. And they have been recorded and they are already posted on our new website. So feel free to go back and check those out. You'll find those two webinars and every webinar that we have done since we started doing these webinars about two years ago. So when you get an opportunity, check that out. So great information. Just go to the website and under the resources tab, then you'll see all of the different videos that are there. All right, so uh, that brings us today. Uh, conservation and practice, we'll get to that. And then we've got one more webinar coming up December 8th. And that will be taking action or where, where do you start? So you as a landowner, where do you start? All right, so that would be our webinar or our virtual series. We've also got a few in-person events that we've had planned. Uh, of course, we've already done one, which we did down in Jones County in the Coastal Plain region at the home of Karen and Alan Plaster. So hopefully those that were able to join, uh, that was a positive and, and fun event for you all. And uh, we've got another one coming up that will be in the Piedmont region. It will be at Shank Memorial Forest, which is in Raleigh, uh, near the state fairgrounds. And it will be, um, it'll be a field tour where we'll, we'll, we will walk along a trail. It's a well-maintained trail, fairly flat. And we're just gonna talk about what a, what a healthy forest means, what that means in the terms of water quality, invasive species, and, and wildlife management. So. Uh, registration for that event will be coming out soon. So check your emails. 
or check us out on social media. But more information about signing up and registering for that event will come out soon. Uh, tickets are $10. Uh, we will be providing lunch for that event as well. But once again, that's the Piedmont Regional Gathering that will be Monday, November 14th from 12 o'clock to 4.30 over at Shank Memorial Forest, which is one of NC State University's managed forests. So we will talk about some of the things that they've been doing over there. Uh, for those of you in the mountain region or would just like to go to the mountains and have, a, have an excuse to go uh, walk outside in the mountains, uh, we are still working on that event. So stay tuned for more information. We are trying to finalize that date and we will get more information to you as soon as we can. So stay tuned. All right, so today's agenda. Of course, I'm, I'm Jennifer Roach, and then we've got Robert Barden, the Associate Dean and Professor with NC State Extension behind the scenes and uh, helps keep us on track. Uh, but our agenda for today, we have got several great speakers. Our first one will be up here in just a few minutes will be Dr. Chris Mormon. He is a Professor and Associate Head of the Department of Forestry and Environmental Resources at NC State University. And then we're going to listen to three brave landowners, three brave women that have um, have agreed to come share their stories and talk about things that are going on on their personal property and uh, maybe share some of their challenges or, or positives or negatives in some of the work that they're doing over there. And then towards the end of the meeting, uh, Fa uh, Fallon Owens, an extension wildlife biologist with the North Carolina Wildlife Commission, is going to lead us in an interactive activity. So uh, more to come on that. So great, great opportunity to hear some good information hear from private landowners, and maybe share your thoughts as well. Uh, this meeting is due to, to be over at 2.30, but uh, we traditionally stay after 2.30 to so about three o'clock. And so if you have more questions, if um, you are not able to get the questions that you have answered and are able to stay past 2.30, then we will stay as long as we have questions or until three o'clock and try to get some of those answered. So hopefully our speakers can uh, stay or as long as they can stay, it'll give you another opportunity to continue to try to communicate with our speakers or some other Forester board members, committee members as well. So we hope you can stay tuned and join us. All right, so uh, Chris, are you out there? Hello. <laughs> All right, so without, um, instead of listening to me, let's get started on what you came here to, to listen to. So uh, Chris Mormon is a professor and associate dean at the Department of Forestry and Environmental Resources at NC State. He holds an MS from the University of Georgia and a PhD from Clemson University in Wildlife Ecology and Management. Chris teaches and conducts research related to integrating wildlife conservation with human activities, including forest management, renewable energy development, urbanization, and agriculture. So. Uh, so Chris, the, the computer of the stage is yours. Thanks, Jennifer. You gave me a promotion. I'm the associate head, not the associate dean. That's Bob's, that's Bob's job. So I'm glad to be here today. I'm gonna give a very brief talk on some ideas related to the underlying principles between that link wildlife with vegetation. Hopefully this will help you understand what you might observe on your own properties and maybe generate some thought about how management might influence vegetation, which in turn will influence the wildlife you'll see on your property. So it's always important for me to start with two statements that, that frame the way we should think about any management activity. And the first is that no forest stand or plant community, no place on the landscape can provide quality habitat for all wildlife species. And related to that, for every management activity or lack thereof, there are winners and losers. And by that, I mean, there's some animals that are gonna be favored, some plants that'll be favored, and some plants and animals that will be uh, deterred or disfavored. So the key take home message from these last two statements, or these, these two statements, is that you must define your focal species. You must set objectives whenever you're trying to establish a management plan on your property. And saying you're gonna manage for wildlife is sort of meaningless because no matter what you do or don't do, you're gonna have wildlife on your property. You need to think about the animals that you really want and then you can tailor your management plan and specific activities in that plan to the plant communities that favor that those focal wildlife and ultimately you'll get those focal wildlife. So I'm gonna 
cover two aspects of the plant community that to me are the most influential on wildlife populations. And one is related to plant succession. So plant succession is the gradual change in vegetation over time, typically following a disturbance. And we can break, break plant succession into a series of serial stages. And these are the, what, are, what are really just temporary stages of succession, unless some sort of disturbance actually keeps uh, succession in place over time. And it's important to recognize that these serial stages are defined largely by the composition of the plant community. So here on the bottom, I have a diagram that comes from our 4-H program that I used to help direct in North Carolina. And this was to help youth understand plant succession and the potential linkages to wildlife. So here, this sort of make-believe uh, successional trajectory has six stages of succession. The first is bare ground following a disturbance. And then there's two and three that'll be herbaceous dominated plant communities. And then stage four will begin to be dominated by woody plants, shrubs, tree sprouts, maybe brambles and the genus Rubus. Stage five would be dominated by shade intolerant, fast growing tree species like Eastern red cedar or Lobali pine. And then stage six would be dominated by more shade tolerant species. It could be our oaks or hickories or ultimately uh, beech and maple. And again, if you heard me talk about those different stages, I was talking about composition. So stages two and three are herbaceous. And typically stage two is dominated by annual herbaceous plants like ragweed or partridge pea. And stage three would be perennial plants like our native warm season grasses and many of our wildflowers. From a wildlife perspective, this is important because in many cases, different animals are linked closely to these different serial stages. So if we're trying to manage for animals linked to an herbaceous community, we're gonna to try to promote stages two and three of succession. If we're trying to manage for an animal that's associated with mature trees, old trees, then we need to manage for stage, stages five and six. So here's a more specific example. This is an old graph. I think this came from Eugene Odom's publications. I don't remember exactly, but this shows you how birds can be linked to specific serial stages or successional stages. Here they call them community types, but they're really just successional stages. And the, the grasshopper sparrow, which is a, an early succession grassland meadow species, is only gonna occur in those grassland grass rub communities. Field sparrow, which can tolerate a little more of a woody component, may um, extend into young pine forest. Cardinal is a generalist, our state bird is a generalist, so it occurs across multiple serial stages as long as the structure is right. And then we get up here on the top and you see species that are associated with more mature forest, wood thrush, hooded warbler, and summer tanager. Birds are very predictable in this sense. Now there are other animals that range more widely that are not gonna be so predictably linked to serial stages like white-tailed deer, wild turkey, or a coyote. They're gonna actually uh, use a variety of these different serial stages. What about cottontail rabbits? They're pretty predictable and somewhat specialized, and they're most likely going to be associated with these uh, early stages of succession, stages two, three, and um, stages one, two, and three is what I would say. What about a gray squirrel? If you're trying to manage for gray squirrels, you want to promote these later successional stages, stages five and six. So you have mature trees, you have uh, denning trees, and you have hard mass produced by species like oaks. Now, the, um, this group is called Forester, so you might think that the focus is entirely on forests, but I think not. And I think some of the other speakers are going to talk about um, early successional communities. So I wanted to briefly describe the incredible benefit of these early successional plant communities, and they're often overlooked. So when, when a majority of the vegetation is near the ground, there's tremendously high forage production for an animal like white-tailed deer or uh, a cottontail rabbit. The grass forb components that are predominant in these young um, or these, these early successional communities provide excellent nesting and brooding cover for wild turkeys, uh, for northern Bob White quail, as you see here. They're obviously, I've already mentioned, uh, critical habitat for grassland uh, bird species. They provide habitat for cotton rats. Brambles are food and cover, so these early successional plant communities are often um, have a predominant bramble component, and brambles would be plants in the genus Rubus that would include blackberry, dewberry, and raspberry. 
And then when you start to get some woody sprouts or you get shrubs in these communities, they provide important thermal cover, uh, protective cover from predators, and they may even provide some fruits. So here is a photo of a plant community that's in stage two of succession is what I would call it because it's dominated by perennial herbaceous grasses and forbs. To be in all honesty, this is a photo I took in New Mexico, but these sorts of communities can be seen all across North America. And you, will, you can see similar communities like this in North Carolina. And I think you'll see some later in another talk. You might call this an old field, a fallow field, or a meadow, but, but ultimately this is just an early successional plant community in stage two of succession. And here we would expect eastern meadowlarks, grasshopper sparrows, cotton rats, wild turkey broods, and maybe even deer fawns, because uh, these animals or the life cycle of those animals is going to be closely linked to this specific cereal stage. Without this successional stage on the landscape, um, you will not see some of these animals present, or maybe wild turkey broods will not be very successful, and deer fawns will have to be dropped in, less, in lower quality locations. Now, through management, we manipulate plant succession, and the most common form of management that, that we have in our forest is planting. So we often plant uh, pine seedlings, typically loblolly pine seedlings, seedlings, and this speeds succession. So this is after a timber harvest, seedlings will be planted. This is, this is a relatively early successional community right now, but with the seedlings that are planted, we see a rapid shift. This is stage, uh, this is year two after planting. And you can see that the um, woody pine seedlings are already starting to become more dominant. There is, a, there is a large component of herbaceous plants here, as you see. So I would still say we're in stage two, but three years after planting, we're already in stage three of succession because here the woody plants have begun to dominate. We see um, lolly 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 pine, maybe wing sumac. Um, you see sweet gum, red maple, and other woody plants that are dominating here very soon after planting. So we, through management, we've had, we have sped up succession and the animals that would be associated with those early successional stages are gonna lose habitat. And this is my PhD student. This was the last day of his field field work in the last year of his field project. So he was pretty excited. So if you remember that graph I showed before where we had old field succession and we had these bird communities associated with these different successional stages. If we plant pines, we eliminate those early stages of succession very quickly. And we, we even have a very short, uh, what, I, what says here, grass for a uh, grass shrub stage. Um, so we still may get a shrubland stage for shrubland songbirds and shrubland obligates like northern bobwhite quail, but it goes away very quickly as the canopy of those planted pines closes and it matures into later stages of, of succession. So the bird community is going to begin largely with, I would say, probably very brief time for prairie warbler and field sparrow, but it's going to quickly move the cardinal in these late successional species. Let's think a little bit about a hardwood stand. So this is a mature hardwood stand you may see in some mid or high elevation sites in Western North Carolina. And a common civil cultural practice would be to come in and clear cut that hardwood stand and allow natural regeneration. And the natural regeneration is gonna come largely from stump sprouts. And those sprouts are gonna come back very quickly. They're actually the same. These are the same trees that were there before the clear cut harvest. Uh, the rootstock is still there, so these sprouts are the same trees, they're just in a smaller stature. So in fact, um, we really haven't shifted the successional stage at all, we've just shift, shifted the structure within the same successional stage. And this is only five years after a clear-cut harvest, very dense stem density here. So if you remember that graph before, now we've eliminated essentially all, well, we haven't really moved back in, in, in successional stage, we clear-cut this late um, stage oak hickory forest. Stump sprouts came back very quickly. We may have a very brief period of, might see it, a, we could see it over here, just a very brief period of shrubland where we see some shrubland birds like prairie warblers, indigo buntings, but super quickly we're going to move back into this oak history, oak hickory condition, and the birds that we would see there would be wood thrush, hood warbler, and summer tanner. So again, we've manipulated structure within that serial stage, but we haven't changed the serial stage or the successional stage. So we probably haven't changed the bird community that much. So I've, I've talked about plant succession, and now I'm gonna briefly talk about 
uh, structure and um, structure is super important um, to animals, especially to birds. When I talk about structure, I'm referring to the vertical structure in your forest. And we typically break our forest into, down into layers. We have the overstory, which is the canopy up here. We have the midstory, which are the plants that are growing in the middle layers of the forest. And then we have the understory layer. And I typically like to break the understory layer up into the shrub layer that's dominated by woody plants. And then the herbaceous layer that's on the ground that's dominated by grasses and forbs. So you can sort of estimate the vertical structure of your forest stand by figuring out how many layers are present. This little cartoonistic graph of a forest has lots of layers present. We have ground we have the ground cover, the shrub layer, the midstory layer, and the canopy layer. So we have, we, you might say we have high vertical structure or you have complex vertical structure. The challenge with creating this sort of condition is that sunlight is a limiting factor. So I talked to students about Mrs. Sun, Mrs. Sun shines down. And when there's a very dense canopy, light cannot reach the layers below. So we tend to not have a complex uh, structure. So it's very difficult to create this super complex structure because all these different layers are competing with, with each other for light and other resources. But through management, we can make changes. Birds are super connected to these uh, vertical layers, and I'll show you a graph in a second. But because they can fly, they have wings, they, they're able to segregate themselves vertically up and down this vertical profile. And you'll see different species of birds that specialize in the different layers. I always stress that to me, the understory is the forgotten layer. It is a super important layer. The picture of the hardwood forest that we had at the beginning um, when everybody was entering the, the, the webinar showed a hardwood forest with very little understory structure, and that's because the canopy was closed. So we need light to the forest floor to get understory structure. This is where many of our animals live. The animals that are retained to the ground by gravity like humans, um, the animals that can't fly or climb. This includes white-tailed deer, northern bobwhite quail, cotton-tailed rabbits, wild turkeys, largely. Um, shrub nesting, songbirds, foxes, bobcats, and on and on and on. Shrews, and you, know, you just go on and on. So this understory layer is super important. I mentioned that vertical structure is important to birds because they can segregate themselves vertically. Here on the right is another cartoon of a forest with really complex structure. There, there's vegetation in all the layers. And we know that the birds that are associated with each layer, here I have oven bird, which is a ground dwelling species, towhee, which is a shrub uh, dwelling species, ground dwelling species, cardinal, which is upper shrub, midstory, summer tanager, which is midstory, brown headed nuthatches, which is canopy of pine forest, and then the pine warbler, which is also a canopy of pine forest, um, will all be present because all their layers are present. Over here on the left, though, we're missing these middle and lower layers. So I would expect to not see cardinals, towhees, or oven, maybe oven birds over here, it's not the best example, but certainly not cardinals and towhees. Um, oven birds can associate with forests with very little understory structure. They actually prefer that. Um, here's a graph of a, of a forest stand in Chatham County, North Carolina, after a timber harvest. Over here on the left was where a small opening was created by timber harvest. This was a group selection timber harvest. And you can see, because there's a lot of light, you can see the tremendous amount of structure that's developed following the, the light here. Over here on the right is away from that opening, no disturbance, no timber harvest, uh, very little light, so very little structure. And then you'll see an intermediate level of structure in the middle where there's some angled sunlight coming from the opening. Also notable here is that there are lots of little oak seedlings along the margin of this opening. And if you get out in here, there are very few oak seedlings. And that just demonstrates that oaks are intermediate shade tolerant species. So they really love these intermediate light environments when they're regenerating. So this is, this is what I show my students. This is where quail go to die. This is a forest plantation with very poor vertical structure, dense canopy, heavy shading, um, no plants in the midstory or understory, just leaf litter. And if a quail wandered through here, it's gonna be eaten by quail, be eaten by a hawk. Um, otherwise, I would expect to see very low richness of, of plants and animals here because of the heavy canopy shade. Uh, we can fix this through management, and you may hear about how some of the landowners have done this. Here's a plantation with dense understory structure. It lacks midstory, but it's got that really important understory. And that understory likely was created here via management practices like thinning, either pre-commercial or commercial thinning, and the application of prescribed burning to keep that structure near the ground and not allow it to grow into the midstory. 
Uh, just a, a final point is that if you're interested in evaluating whether your property or your forest stand has appropriate structure, um, a friend of mine, Terry Sharp, who is a retired biologist with the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission, um, he actually uses, he recommends the baseball technique for landowners. So you can take a baseball or a softball or a tennis ball and walk out on your property and toss it uh, 10 or 15 feet out in front of you. And if you can still see it, the understory structure is probably a bit sparse to try to have uh, rabbits or quail or other uh, understory associates. So you need to maybe implement some practices to really um, increase that structure near the ground level. Obviously, we've talked about thinning and prescribed burning, and there are other tools that you might use. So in summary, always define your focal species because there's going to be winners and losers no matter what you do or don't do. The wildlife that you may want to attract to your property are going to be linked in some ways to cereal stage, but I think more importantly, they're going to be linked to the vegetation structure in your forest stands. So define your objectives and use the correct terminology when you're talking about it. And I want to note a couple of publications that are available through the Forestry Extension website, NC State University. Maybe this resource has already been shared with the group, but these are two publications that I helped co-developed, one on using prescribed fire to improve wildlife habitat and the other on developing wildlife friendly pine plantations. Um, and this talks about tools that you can use to manipulate your pine stands to create diverse serial stage structure and diverse vertical structure. And that's it. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Chris. That was a great presentation. Uh, hopefully everyone out there is starting to think about uh, for succession and particular wildlife species that you may want to see on your property. Um, as a professional, we hear that all the time from landowners. I just want to manage for wildlife. But as Chris pointed out at the beginning of his presentation, you need to be more specific. You know, talk about the species that you would like to see or maybe enjoy seeing or, uh, hey, uh, is that possible? Um, so uh, great information, Chris. So thank you for that. Um, all right, so before we go into our next um, our next presentation, uh, I want everybody to just uh, be thinking about practices that you've been doing on your land or maybe practices you would like to do on your land. Uh, maybe listening to Chris, you're thinking, oh, wildlife, that's not that's too general. All right, what kind of species do I really want to see on my property? And, and how do I go about doing that? So when we get to the activity in this afternoon or the later part of our meeting, uh, Fallon is gonna talk about that. So, um, so start thinking about that so you can share that information uh, when, when we get closer to that activity. Uh, Bob has put the, um, the plantation management, a friend, wildlife friendly plantation um, brochure, the link to that brochure um, at the NC State Extension website. So uh, in the chat box, so feel free to click on that and that will take you to that. That is the publication that that uh, Chris was referring to in his presentation. So, all right. So thank you again, Chris. All right. So next up, uh, we will move into listening to our landowners and uh, kind of hear what they have to say. So uh, first of all, I'd like to thank all three of you ladies for being here today. Um, and being willing to share your stories. You know, sometimes folks are, aren't always willing to do that. So this is a great opportunity to hear what they're doing on their property and some of the challenges that they may see or some of the positives that they've, they've, uh, they've found and, and also who they've been working with and what they're thinking they want to do on their property. So our first landowner will be Patricia Sowers. So Patricia, uh, the floor is yours. And I'm okay. gonna go ahead and try to share your pictures, okay? Sure. Okay. Hi, I'm Patricia and I um, am from Florida. I moved here about uh, five years ago. Um, I'm currently stewarding uh, 70 acres in Davie County. Uh, it's family land. Uh, it was old tobacco field, uh, pine plantation. I need that brochure, Chris and uh, some hardwoods. And so I moved here to get away from suburbia. Um, suburbia, uh, you know, was basically quarter acre lots of modes, St. Augustine and some, you know, palm trees. Um, and I was witnessing 
Uh, a lot of species decline just in my lifetime of living in Florida, especially the birds and uh, the insects uh, with quite a bit of dread. And so I moved up here to kind of get back to the land. I had no idea of what that was going to be. So when I came here, I realized that really uh, rural Davie County is no different from suburbia. Uh, instead of quarter acre lots, people were mowing huge plots of fescue around their house. Um, there was big monocultures of crops, you know, with no hedgerows. And I didn't see a lot of wildlife. So um, I didn't really know how to begin and what to do. So here begins a series of fortunate events. I uh, joined a native plant society and heard about a woman named Marie Petit in Guilford County. And uh, she had 70 acres that she came back to after she retired and was turning it into a, a wildlife uh, reserve. And um, so I, okay, let's, let's try that. So <laughs> I um, didn't know who to talk to. So I called the county biologist, uh, Jason Smith. And he came out and he said, well, you need a woodland plan. And so we started uh, I got the NC Forest Service out and I said, well, what to do with these fields? They'd been mowed for hay for the last 20 years. Nothing ever put back into them. They were basically invasive plants like little did I know, Cerisa lepidiza and hairy vetch. And so um, we were going to begin with just uh, four acres uh, of conversion to native species. And um, about this time, another serendipitous event occurred. And I um, heard about a fellow biologist named John Eisenhower with NC Wildlife. And he came out and he gave me some real uh, solid advice on converting the fields uh, and working a two-year plan. So starting in 2019, um, we started with, oh, here we go, with the herbicides uh, and cover cropping, and we did that through 2020. And then in 2021, we uh, planted the, um, the natives, and he had gone through quite a bit of work uh, selecting a really luxury list of beautiful native forbs. I didn't even know what Forbes were until I looked it up. And um, warm season grasses. Um, and I was able to purchase this seed uh, through John helping me uh, get an equip uh, with the equip program through the NRCS. And Kay Anderson helped write the uh, contract for me. So in 2021, we um, planned it. And um, they came out with a no-till and drill um, machine and planted that beautiful seed, quite expensive, that you, you pay for it up front and then you get reimbursed once you see that, once they see that you are properly implementing your side of the contract. Well, however, um, and you'll see in some of the videos that first year, was kind of a shock because right after we planted, it got dry, 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 nothing germinated. And then six weeks later, we had what I call a rain bomb, about four inches of rain in three hours. And I thought the entire field was just gone and washed away. And we were kind of ready to declare that a, a total loss. And I'll show you pictures of that in a minute. And you, once you see it, you'll think, oh no, there's nothing gonna be left. It was a total washout like the Mississippi River Delta because it's basically pretty hilly field. And um, so um, we'll get into those videos in just a second, but I, I wanted to give you some interesting statistics uh, from the Southeastern Grassland Initiative um, so 80% of all the grassland in the United States is now gone. I actually thought that was kind of a low figure, but until I, then I learned in the Eastern US, 90 to 99% of our grassland 
depending on what type uh, of grassland it is, like an early successional or more of a grassland stage one, um, uh, it's gone in the Eastern US. And of that grassland, 85% of that grassland is privately owned. So we can do a lot with our private land. However, most of that 85% of that privately owned land is cropland or residential or commercial development. So, and, and in addition to that, it's all threatened by invasive species in a lot of places. So anyway, we can play the videos and I'll, I'll show you what we're seeing. Okay, so this is the fall of the first year of after planting the natives and the birds were thick. Um, I'm trying to capture all of the goldfinches in the field. They stay here year round. There's so much food for them in there with all the seeds from the Forbes. Um, there's a lot of birds out there. I saw uh, past two years, blue grosbeaks. beaks. I'd never seen them before I started this. Um, of course, the indigo buntings love it. Uh, all, like he said, the uh, field sparrows, um, anyway. So we can go to the next video. That's just the fall. I just thought the birds were amazing. That was last fall. Let's see, that one's not mine. So we can go to those top. Okay, so um, this is late summer last year. And these are narrow leaf sunflowers you're seeing in Biden's Aristosa, also known as bearded tick seed. They are in full force right now. The field is golden yellow with these forbs right now. But what you can't see, and if you walk around the field like I do almost every day, and note to self, make yourself some mode pass if you do this so you don't get entirely trashed every time you go through the field. But anyway, so um, this is uh, just, it just showed up beautifully late summer last year. Uh, but all sorts of treasures here to see. Um, you can't see them. There's blue aster in there. Uh, the, let's see, the spotted uh, bee balm is in there. Uh, a bunch of other things that John Eisenhower recommended had showed up. We are especially pleased to see the common milkweed starting to come up. Partridge pea. Um, there's a few pie weeds out there. Some of them didn't, did not show up, but we had really good success with a lot of them. Okay, we can go to the next one. Okay, this is June of this year. This is after, after the Coreopsis had bloomed. Uh, now we've got the Black Eyed Susans in full force. Uh, you, there's also a lot of fleabane showed up, which was a bonus. The cone flowers are showing up now this year, the second year. I wish you could hear the bird song, just continual bird song uh, and insect buzzing. If you plant it, they will come. I'm sure you've heard that before, and they did. So that's in front of the house. That's three and a half acres right there. And we can go to the next one. Okay, so this is most recently, this was in August. And you can see the field has changed. Uh, now we've got the Aristosa Bidens, the tick seed showing up. A lot of the other stuff has died back and providing seed. Uh, the butterflies right now are just amazing. Um, I'm providing a lot of larval sources for them. The bearded tick seed is one of the, well, it's providing nectar, but the par partridge pea is providing a larval source for the yellow sulfurs. Um, I've seen more butterflies than I, it's been very beautiful and I can't capture it, but anyway, <laughs> they're there. Um, and monarchs too, um, which I was really pleased to see using the, the milkweed. Maybe you can see it, I probably went too fast, but there's a lot of surprises in there. 
the gross beaks are making their little ticking sound, calling to their family members. They raised a brood and they're this year, the blue gross beaks. Okay, thank you. It's hard to see, isn't it? Sorry. Uh, and there should be one of the catastrophe uh, when we first planted. There it is. Okay. So this was right after the field was planted and everything just washed. I don't know if you can see it, but that doesn't even really capture it. But the whole field was washing all of the cover. You know, there was a light organic cover over the top. It was all gone after this. We thought it was a complete failure. And uh, I was a little bit worried about the erosion. So actually went out there and planted some um, millet uh, to help stabilize the soil and really didn't need to because boy, things started showing up uh, in June and it turned out okay. And it was not deemed a failure. It worked out um, pretty amazing that those seeds held, you know. So I think it may, may have contributed to maybe some of my problems. I'm not sure because I'm still fighting invasives, especially the Cerisa. Um, I do a lot of spot spraying. I do a lot of hand pulling. I personally can't stand mare's tail. So I know it's a native, but I don't like it. So, uh, but what I do like is how much wildlife it has um, brought in. And, and really how I look at it, it's really not about what I want anymore. It's what the, it's what the, uh, what nature wants. Um, I feel like it's time, it's their time, their turn now. Humans have, they're good to go. All right, so we need, we need the wildlife. Anyway, thank you so much and I'm all done. I hope I didn't go over my time. Thank you and I love to answer any questions later. Thank you. That was great, Pat. Uh, thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, hopefully everyone sure. was able to see those videos and, uh, and some of the awesome work that you've got growing on your property there. So a uh, wonderful example of uh, early successional habitat. So uh, thank you very much for sharing that. Um, You're all right, we'll, we'll hold all of our questions to the end. And uh, uh, Chris, I apologize. I totally skipped over giving you an opportunity to answer a few questions. And so um, we will get back to that soon. I, I apologize for that. All right. So next I'll hang out till the end. Okay, great. Thank you very much. All right. So our next speaker will be Michelle Rigsby. So Michelle, if you are ready. Hey everyone, I'm Michelle. I live in the Northern Piedmont of North Carolina in Vance County. And the back of our farm is actually the Virginia state line. So we're about as far North in the part of North Carolina that we're in that you can be. We have a approximately 40 acres of a timber tree farm. We uh, decided to, just like the lady before us, the suburbia, I was done with it. I got a breast cancer diagnosis in 2017, which finally made me go, okay, time to move. So luckily I was able to talk my husband into coming with me, which I was very glad to be able to have him to jump with me at the same time. But it was, Definitely a very interesting experience, an amazing learning experience. I grew up in the country, of course I was young, and so I didn't have the responsibility, but I'd learned a lot as a child where I grew up. But uh, at the time we started thinking about buying this land and it's actually, I don't know if anybody's familiar with the Car Lake Reservoir Lake, we're on a peninsula on that lake. And so we have, um, uh, quite, quite a lot of farmland around us and a lot of woods around us where we are. So there's an interesting mix of land and fields where we are. But when we decided to buy the property where we went to church in Raleigh, there was a young man there that was a consulting forester and somebody suggested that we contact him and see what he would think about the property. So that's what we did. And I have to admit a consulting forester 
is worth their weight in gold as with the NC Forestry Service, the Forest Her program, your USDA, your um, farm service agencies. There's so much knowledge out there and you don't have to go far to find it. So Thomas came up and he uh, went through our uh, acreage with a fine tooth comb, came up with an amazing farm plan for us. So it kind of just blossomed from there. And um, so we decided to come up here and build and I'm retired now. And uh, I say retired, I actually, this is my full-time job, which I am very passionate about. But we were able to come up and be a part of this community where we fit right in, right from the very beginning. So that was a true blessing right there. But the people, like I said before, the different agencies and stuff that will work with you have been indispensable. So when we decided to go ahead and move forward with the farm plan, we were certified with the American Tree Farm System. And we've since also become certified as a um, for stewardship program participant, which has been very helpful. So we've also had um, NC Wildlife out here to give us ideas on what we can do to help our property to flourish. One of those, not only from the consulting forester and the forestry service um, and the um, NC Wildlife was to have a prescribed burn. Uh, very interesting process. In November, we moved up here in 2018, lived in our camper while our house was being built at a nearby campground where we stayed. And um, so that fall of 2019, they came and, um, excuse me, fall of 2018, came and did a herbicide release by helicopter to kill the understory. Uh, didn't bother the pine trees, but to get rid of your brambles and your briars and sweet gums and just kind of, for lack of a better term, your junk trees. So they came and they took care of that for us. And um, we ended up seeing results come spring when nothing got its leaves again and stuff. So we were very excited that that had happened. So during 2019, we saw a lot of changes in our woods, started seeing more uh, pileated woodpeckers, more uh, bluebirds, more um, indigo buntings. And so in the process, I've also hung more bluebird houses and we've left many snags throughout the woods, which are super for the pileated woodpeckers and the smaller woodpecker species. So that has been an amazing experience to hear them and to see them because they're such a big bird. It just is fascinating. We also saw an uptick in bobwhite quail and of course your coyotes and I've seen bear scat and we know we have bear up, up here as well, a lot of fox. Um, but luckily pretty much everything leaves my chickens alone which I'm very happy about and I hope it stays that way. Uh, but they have a nice area to forage as well because of the things we've had done. Well, in spring of 2020, we had our prescribed burn. The Forestry Service were contracted to do that for us, and I couldn't have asked for better people to take care of that for us. Um, Jennifer, would you start scrolling through these fire pictures for me, please? Thank you. And um, there's uh, Rob uh, Robertson from the Forestry Service. He was an indispensable part on getting this taken care of for us, as well as all the folks that were a part of this. We were even lucky enough to have our local fire department from where we live to come and do a training session here while this was going on. And this view here is from my dining room window. And this is how close it was to my house, but I was never scared. And you can even see in the background, one of the forestry gentlemen back there, making sure everything stays where it's supposed to be. So I was scared at first, but then as it progressed, um, Rob Montague came and got me and took me for a ride to see it up close and personal. And I felt very safe because I know that they are extremely trained in what they're doing. And there's our fire department and that truck is called Big Sioux. And they were able to come out and do an excellent training experience. So I was able to help my community as well with this as this truck was able to go way back in the acreage and to be able to take care of the fire as needed to be taken care of. And they posted all the signs and everything we needed to get it done. And so we were really, really pleased with the work that was done by the forestry service and our consulting forester had scheduled all of this. And you can see by this picture, this is kind of what it looked like right afterwards. And I wish I'd gotten some pictures in the week that followed. All the downed logs and everything were picked 
completely apart by wild turkeys. And I knew we had a population of them, but never realized quite how many turkeys we had until I would ride the fire lines on the tractor and see how much they could actually get rid of for us and picking out the grubs. And I, I, it truly, I believe, helped the decomposition of what had fallen to, to move on to the next step. So we started seeing all sorts of wildflowers coming up and ferns and um, the bird species increased. And I went and I added, I think I believe I have a total of 16 bluebird houses right now or 14, I can't remember off the top of my head, but um, so we saw quite an uptick of those birds around and we did those under the power lines and along the fire lines where they had more of an open area to browse but uptick in deer populations. Um, so eventually we would like to be able to allow family and friends and neighbors to come and hunt here if they'd like. And that's a view of the pond right after the first uh, fire that we had. And um, that opened that area up quite a bit for us, which made it very nice because it's a beautiful feature that we do have on our farm. And in turn, we've seen more turtles and laying eggs in fact when the, and, um, gentleman from NC Wildlife was here, we came across this female laying eggs on the other side of that pond. So that was very encouraging me to me to see these types of um, advancements for our farm. And I am just so thrilled with what that prescribed burn did for us. And um, this is the next, um, or actually that was later that fall of the first year after the burn. So it just, and you can kind of see it trailed up on the bottoms of the trees. There was a few places where the fire got kind of high, but it's because the tree was covered with vines and things. And we also found a giant boulder we never knew was back there that was vine covered. So that was a really big surprise for us. But I think what I've learned so much about this experience is taking time to see all the, the things that have been given to us by this time to be able to experience the woods and to be able to go out there and work. It's a wonderful thing to be able to go out and experience what you can help grow and create and work with nature to make your home and your homestead or your land a better place for the world, a better place for yourself, for your grandchildren, for, for the generations to come. And that's my main goal. Next, I want to um, be a pollinator habitat. That's my next step. And so I've been planting a lot of native flower beds with the pink swamp milkweed, the orange milkweed. So hopefully I can increase the pollinators on my farm. But um, I wanna thank Forrest Her for asking me to speak during this. I'm open to any questions afterwards. And I hope you all gained a little bit of knowledge of what being a landowner can do. And uh, don't forget, there's lots of funding out there. You don't have to do this by yourself. There's funding for everybody if you just look for it. Thank you. That was awesome, Michelle. Uh, thank you so much for sharing that and some of the work that's being done out there and those prescribed burn pictures. Uh, definitely you. a lot of a lot of things you have going on out there. So thank you very much for sharing that. Great presentation. All right, so uh, we'll hold the questions for Michelle to the end, um, but we're going to go to our third landowner, Joanne Rebick. So Joanne, um, I believe you've got some slides. So uh, the the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, as I get my screen set up here, uh, I want to, you know, I appreciate the opportunity to share my experiences uh, that I've had. Um, uh, to get started, I am out in the mountains. My husband and I um, live in Madison County. It is just north, the county north of Buncombe County, which is home to Asheville. Uh, we uh, are both, I have to put a plug in, alum uh, NC State. Uh, I'm a, a Northern transplant um, in the botany department. Uh, and we took, it took us almost 30 years to get back to North Carolina. Um, I'm a retired research scientist with the Forest Service. So since a young child, I've always enjoyed being in the woods 
and this was, uh, I mean, was fortunate to make a career of it. And then now in retirement, um, enjoy uh, life, life in the, in the woods. And um, we, just to give you an idea of where we are located, this is, I'm also blessed. This is the view from my house that I get to see every morning um, as I start my day. Um, so just to kind of give you geographically, you can see um, we're over here almost at, as Michelle said, she was on the Virginia border. We're almost on the Tennessee border, uh, due north of, of Asheville. Um, we are trying to get my mouse to work and I'm not sure why. There we go, a little slow. Um, let me go. You know, that's it. So I guess this, I was really excited to, to hear both Pat and Michelle talk about utilizing uh, local resources. And I just made a list of the agencies that I have worked with um, since we acquired our property. We, I should back up a bit. We acquired our property in 2013 um, moved here full time in 2019 and um, have been working on it, uh, various sections of it. But again, um, I can't reiterate what, what both Pat and Michelle have said about the opportunities, the, the support, the cost sharing, the resources, the wonderful, wonderful service that you can get um from these various resources one of the things you know i discovered was um we actually the previous landowner we were uh registered as a farm with the um farm services administration and with that uh lends uh even more opportunities of some cost share programs County Extension Service to be able to purchase low cost um, seedlings, herbaceous woody shrubs, uh, the Audubon in North Carolina. I'll get into some of um, those specifics as I as I go through. Um, so I've got a lot of noise on my screen here, so I'm going to see um, one of the things that we did just to kind of give you an overview. So we're in Western North Carolina. Um, we have some pretty challenging topography. Um, our elevation goes up as high as uh, almost 4,000 feet. So we've got some really cool vegetation, um, but we've got a lot of different types of uh, parcels in plant communities as um, Chris Mormon was, was mentioning. So we have different management object, objectives based on, on um, where we are on our property. And um, we acquired um, our first parcel in 2013, um, the more uh, that upper Northeast section, about 15 acres. Uh, and that's where we built our, eventually built our home in 2019. And that's a mixture. We have some open areas as well as some mature forests. Uh, this other area uh, we acquired, it went into foreclosure in 2019, uh, about 30 acres. So we have a total of, of close to 45 acres um, with a lot of different habitat um, and community structure in there. We've got creeks running through our property. We have a small pond. And if you can see in the lower um, bottom uh, right corner, that kind of interesting piece that um, unfortunately had been harvested prior in 2016, prior to us purchasing the property. I think the previous landowner was trying to uh, generate some income and not lose the property. Um, but unfortunately um, he, took away all the high quality um, timber and left, you know, a lot of, a lot of junk trees, I would say. So initially, uh, you know, some of our early challenges were one, we had very high deer densities 
and that was reducing potential regeneration of our trees, of our shrubs. It was in, it's been impacting, you know, the forbs, the herbaceous plants on the property. Um, I have a neighbor who likes to feed the deer and I've tried to have conversations with, with him uh, to try to understand, you know, explain the importance of having the right uh, numbers of deer. So we're, we're working, this is, a, that's an ongoing um, issue. Um, we had a lot of grapevines um, come when we acquired our first parcel we're not sure when that was was harvested, but you can see in this picture, uh, this is about gosh, om almost eight years later. A lot of that is actually um, residual grapevines, you know, dead grapevines, but to the point where they were smothering uh, the tree canopies. And um, so we are trying to open up and let more light down to the forest floor. We are also dealing with um, invasive plants and insects, and I'll talk about some of the plant challenges um, a little bit in a few minutes. Um, but we also had um, emerald ash borers moved into uh, the area, and as well as hemlock woolly adelgid, uh, we do have a, a small number of hemlock trees, but the idea of trying to keep the uh, as much diversity in the tree species, the types of trees that we have as possible. Um, so we wanted to deal with that. And I mentioned earlier about the uh, high grade harvest of the one parcel that um, was really left of just a lot of um, undesirable, really um, species that don't support a lot of um, wildlife as far as for food and, and shelter. Um, so some of the initial things that we did um, employ was we have um, deer hunters come in to help um, manage the population. Um, and we're not quite seeing the impact of that yet. That's only been about three years. Um, I did a um, planting campaign um, early on trying to get, add some species of trees that we didn't have present um, already, uh, in particular, some fruit bearing trees and, and shrubs, as well as um, some native plants. And um, note, an important note, if you're going to do that and you have deer problems, you need to protect your those plantings from deer browsing because they it is like can't some of these are like candy to them another thing we did was we um did an i i went and did an inventory and tried to loc i located um the what we considered the high value um ash trees and hemlock trees and did a uh, soil branch which would help deter the uh the invasive insects, the EAB and the hemlock woolly adelgid, and that's an ongoing process. And we did a lot of sawing of these massive grapevines and, you know, cutting those down also. Um, just to give you an idea of what that harvest looked like um, for that one parcel of land, it was, um, you can see there's logging roads, skid trails, invasive plants moved in there, um, but we are trying to maintain those as, as hiking trails, but um, you can see very little um, left of the um, residual, there are very few um, remaining trees. Uh, this is a picture of what um, one section looks like now. So we're getting into, um, you can see some of the surviving um, mature trees, but we do have that shrub and tree regeneration going on. Unfortunately, um, a lot of oak trees were harvested, but they are not regenerating. We're getting a lot of the faster growing um, shade um, intolerant species like uh, yellow poplar, maples, some of the cherries coming in. And um, 
we may have to resort to some planting um, of some oaks in there since those are really a keystone species for um, a lot of wildlife. Um, some of the other things that we've been doing on our property, um, and this is uh, right near our, where our house was built. Uh, you can see in 2019, uh, we that one picture of, of what that hill looked like, it's a pretty steep slope and what it looks like um, just within a few weeks ago. So we, I decided to um, you know, create some pocket, what I'm calling uh, pocket prairies in these areas. Uh, and some of the same things that you've heard from um, Pat when she was talking about um, converting those pastures into um, prairies and um, native plants. The other thing we try to that um, is an ongoing thing is is to keep it open and remove as we we get um, young trees coming in. Um, I go in and chop those down. Sometimes uh, I use herbicides. Multiple I use multiple tools to um, get with some of my you know management practices. Um, so just to give you an idea, and this is what. Um, things look like from that bare slope. Um, it, I didn't see as fast results as um, Patricia saw. Uh, the, it, it requires at least where I live up at about 3,900 feet. It requires a lot of patience. Um, and yes, seed is expensive. I did some collections of seeds. Um, I um, purchased some seeds but uh, things take a really long time to establish, but it's just been an amazing spectacle of butterflies, all kinds of pollinators, um, wild turkey coming through, all kinds of wildlife. Well, we do have bear, we have bobcat, um, a lot of white-tailed deer, but um, we're maintaining um, this. And this is just some of the species that we've been able to establish in what I call my mountaintop um, pocket prairie. Um, I'm gonna shift to another parcel on the other side of our road um, where it used to be is registered with the FSA um, as a farm. Uh, this is a, about a little, about a six acre, um, a, what I would call abandoned um, you know, pasture or farm field. And um, you can see to, I guess to the left, um, there's a, the stream runs through there. Um, you can see there's a right of way utility power line going um, just to the right of that. Um, so what, what we're doing is um, maintaining this as early successional habitats. So those stages, of um, one through about three. And um, we've got, a it's, it's very um, different as far as the soil moisture goes, close to the creek, it's very moist. So we have some different plant communities there as opposed to upslope near the road, it's a little bit drier, but this area is uh, surrounded by an intact forest. And, um, Here's um, another serendipitous event to share. Uh, I was attending the 29, the fall 2019 Forest Her in-person workshop in Morganton and had the uh, opportunity to interact with um, Amy Poncho from the Audubon North Carolina. North Carolina Audubon, she had a display up during one of the, our breaks and I learned about golden winged warbler um, population that was very close to my house. And Amy and I started talking and um, I described my, how, my uh, property and it turns out that this parcel had many of the characteristics, the preferred habitat for the golden winged warbler. The golden winged warbler is declining. It is a high elevation 
species. Uh, it's a neotropical, so it, it comes up from South America and Central America uh, and breeds for a very short period of time in these high elevation Appalachian area forests, um, as well as parts of the upper Midwest. So it has very, as, as Chris said earlier, very particular habitat requirements. So with those conversations with Amy, um, as I described the, um, this parcel of land, um, we uh, set up to do for Amy uh, to come out and do surveys and assess a little more closely um, this prop this parcel. Um, so that was super exciting. And um, I'll share some of the things that um, Amy and I talked about. Amy um, prepared a wonderful management plan, summarized the birds that she observed both in, 19, in 2020 and 2021. Um, we do have a lot of invasive plant challenges. The two, our two big ones are um, Miscanthus, also known as uh, Chinese silver grass and Japanese stilt grass, a microstegium, that's an annual. And um, they're in different parts of the property, but um, we are trying multiple ways, uh, creative tools. Uh, that's my son there. We are trying a little mixture of, of burning and then herbiciding the sprouts of the silver grass. Um, Japanese stilt grass, we've tried, I've tried hand pulling, um, mowing at the right time. But the thing I guess to recommend to all of you is that um, depending on the problem and the location, um, there are folks that can help you um, recommend best practices, best treatments, and don't be afraid to try things and experiment. And you can see um, that the uh, back of my uh, Kawasaki mule, um, that was just one hand pulling session of the um, Japanese stilt grass that came in on heavy equipment when our driveway was um, being um, constructed. So I'm to the point now where um, I'm trying to do mowing, but keep it out of the forest. So doing you know lots of monitoring to make sure that it doesn't move in into the forest, um, it's really difficult one to um, control. One of the other uh, recommendations that um, Amy had uh, proposed in this management, the habitat management plan was um, we're removing, you can see um, that open field, but those, those are yellow poplars and there's some white pines um, encroaching in that. So we're doing removal of those, um, cutting them down or, and also doing some herbicide treatments um, prior to um, cutting them down. So to try to um, keep them, keep it a more open habitat. Um, another opportunity that I had and I recommend if you have a utility right of way through your property, um, you can take over, at least I was able to take over the management and vegetation control of the right of way um, with an agreement with the Rural Electric Co-op that we're members of. Uh, if, you, if you can arrange to have that happen, I highly recommend it. If you don't, um, these uh, power companies are on a schedule to go in and treat uh, with an herbicide, typically in the middle of the summer, during the most critical time for uh, brooding, for bro bird brooding nesting. Um, so I'm responsible uh, for maintaining it, um, keeping it open. They have outlined, you know, what their requirements are. But another, you know, uh, really helpful thing is for you to, if you're interested, um, you know, maintain it yourself. Um, we are also um, doing some mowing, some patch mowing about every couple of years and creating these clumps of shrubs that the golden winged warblers prefer to nest in. 
um, as well as some other uh, early successional bird species. There, I've done some planting of elderberry and will continue to plant with some other species. Uh, we identified some what we consider legacy, some established um, fruit bearing trees, apple trees and hawthorn trees and keeping those to provide food for wildlife. Um, we've had some bear activity and deer also, you know, enjoy uh, consumption of these apples. Um, as I wrap up, this is um, one of the areas right under the right of way. And you can see um, right now it's just beautiful with, um, we've done no supplemental planting of any um, herbaceous, any forbs or grasses in this section, just trying to control um, a lot of the, the woody vegetation um, that we have in the property. And with that, I hope I didn't talk too long. Um, I'll turn it back over to Jennifer. Joanne, that was great. Thank you so much. That was an amazing presentation. And uh, we definitely appreciate you sharing all the work that you've got going on up there in Western North Carolina. So uh, you three ladies have your hands full for sure. Um, but it was great to hear your stories and kind of what who the, the people you're talking to and the, the, the help that you're looking for. But I have to say, it's amazing to sit here and listen to all three of you ladies talk about specific uh, bird species and wildlife that you're seeing. And most importantly, all the different native plants that are out there. So th that's amazing to hear. Um, so we do have a few questions and they're right on time. Um, so first of all, let's talk about the stilt grass issue. We have a few from that and a few comments from Chris and Fallon. Um, but one of our participants asked, uh, stilt grass has just, you know, stilt grass has taken over so much of the understory and wetland areas, and she was looking for thoughts. So um, as you had mentioned, Joanne, in your presentation and doing some hand pulling and, and uh, the work that you're up against with uh, battling that invasive, very invasive grass, uh, Chris Mormon, uh, just to make his statement, he had offered an answer that stilt grass is a challenge because it's an annual grass that reproduces and spreads aggressively. Uh, definitely has low or no value as food for wildlife and uh, can be pulled by, by hand pulling like you were, were showing Joanne. Um, or you can also use a low dose of, of glyphosate, which is a herbicide. Um, but uh, one statement that he does make and maybe he can get on here and, and, and help share this as well. But uh, uh, you may, in some cases, it may be best accepted as new part of the plant community because it is so diff difficult to control. And, um, and Joanne, you said it, you were really just trying to, to monitor it and mow it and do what you could to, to keep it out of the forest. But, uh, but Chris, do you have any more thoughts on that? I guess I should have let you read that. But uh, uh, No, I'll leave it to the landowners to provide their feedback. I, it's an individual decision, but I think everybody needs to recognize that you're never going to be able to eliminate Japanese grass from your property now, for steel grass from the property. I have it in my lawn in downtown Raleigh. So maybe develop a plan, uh, maybe use a triage system and work, look at areas where it's more easily controlled or areas where it may be in direct conflict with your management objectives. And that would be where you'd focus your efforts initially. Um, but it's a, it's a it's spread easily by water, by foot traffic, by animals. It's an annual. It super uh, reproduces aggressively. Um, it's got a wa fairly wide range of light tolerance required. Light tolerance. Um, it's super abundant on the landscape now, so it's always going to be there. You can get rid of it. And also, it has seeds that persist in the seed bank for some period of time. So mm -hmm. it's it's a long term challenge. One of the as things are most I, of our invasive plants. Yeah, that's why they're they're, they're problems. Um, one of the other things um, is the timing of the mowing. I mean, you can mow, and I agree with everything that that Chris has shared. Um, it is a late a late um, seeding species, so if you can time your mowing before it goes to seed but not too early because if you mow too early, you can get a branching and it can actually produce even more seeds. Um, I've also tried mixing, doing hand pulling and then uh, overseeding with clover and some grass species and 
that was not that was somewhat successful for the first year but then yeah the the still grass just took over um there are some folks that are looking at a potential biocontrol of uh, foliar fungus but uh i haven't heard in years any success with that and that's a pretty tricky thing because it's very much dependent on the environment but um yeah, just accepting, <laughs> tolerating it, and, and you could just battle it forever. Um, cleaning your equipment, though, if you don't want to move it to a new area, uh, be careful with the mowing and the timing of your mowing, and just keep you know your your boots clean. Uh, be vigilant. Great, thank you. That you're exactly right, Joanne. That's awesome. Great words of wisdom there. Um, and Fallon Owens, uh, if you want to take us into our, our next activity, uh, you had also made the statement, just like Joanne, of, of timing is a very important factor. So uh, trying to do that hand pulling or mowing uh, before the seed comes out, which is in the fall. So uh, very, very important there. So uh, some very good guidance there. So um, we'll, if you have any more questions, please feel free to go ahead and type them into the chat box. And uh, we're going to go ahead and let Fallon move on to our next activity. And then we'll come back to those questions at the end if we have time. And then um, if we need to stay over or if anyone was interested in staying over to ask a few more questions, then please just go ahead and continue to type those in and we'll try to get to them. All right. So Fallon, if you are ready to lead us into our next activity. Yeah, for sure. Thank you, Jennifer. And um, I, I've been battling my, my own very small scale battle with Japanese stiltgrass in my own yard, tracked in by some contractors who are working on my basement. I also live in, in downtown or close to downtown Raleigh, like um, like Chris Mormon, but um, they, they kind of just tracked in. You could see the path that they took to get from my um, the front of my house to the, the basement entrance because it was just stilt grass and I've been hand pulling it. Managed, I think this year I managed to, I think, get rid of pretty much all of it, but that timing is super key, like in small patches. When it's, when you got a creek running through your property and you got stilt grass along the creek, you're, you're just not going to win that battle. <laughs> so, um, you know, pick your, pick your battles, right? There's, there's but so much time we have to, um, and caring that we have to, to do these projects. Um, so try to put your, all, all that effort and work and caring into something that's actually going to manage to be successful. Um, so with all of these amazing stories from landowners who are working on their properties and doing conservation on their land, um, hopefully you guys have been thinking about um, what your management goals are. I, I loved Chris's prompt about how you can't just manage for wildlife. You need to manage for specific species or suites of wildlife because, you know, wildlife in general have different requirements. So you need to pick um, what type of habitat you want to provide for them. And then the wildlife will come that can live in that habitat. So now I want to do a, a really quick activity that hopefully is engaging for all of you and whoever attended our conversation on conservation webinar at the beginning of the year, we're going to do a similar activity where I'm going to share a link in the chat. So if you don't have the chat open, go ahead and open it now. Again, um, you can just click that little button, the chat button on the bottom of your screen and you should see your, your chat box come up. And there's a link that goes to uh, linoit.com. Um, and then my name is in there. And if you just click on that link real quick, it should open up a web browser. And there you will see, and I changed things up a little bit um, based on the conversation, there are two prompts. So I'm not going to share my screen yet because I want you to focus on clicking on that link and, and seeing this activity on your web browser first. And then I'm going to share my screen so we can all see the same screen. But basically what you do is you should see two prompts, one on the left that says, share a management goal for your land. And then another that says share a conservation project that you want to do on your land. Um, and you can on the sort of the right side of the screen, you should see um, a couple sticky pads that if you click on one of those, it'll open up a little text box and you can type in um, what you want, either a management goal or a conservation project. Um, stick to one. Um, per per sticky because you can do multiple stickies. So each sticky pad or sticky that you post can be a different idea. And if you haven't figured out a conservation project, you know maybe you can start really thinking about what your management goals are and focus on that 
first. Um, if you have your management goals set and you already have conservation practices that you want to do or are already working on, um, share that. So uh, I'll give you a second and um, I want you guys to, again, go to that, that um, follow that link and toy around and see if you can post some um, some stickies on here. I already see some popping up, so I'll give I'll give you like a, a few more seconds to find that that link in case you haven't already, and then I'm going to share my screen so we can see what everybody's writing. And I see some good stuff so far. So all right, I think. Thanks and seeing some good stuff at any point you can post stickies throughout this conversation and even afterwards this link is going to be good for months until I, I um, get rid of it so you can if you come up with new ideas you can visit again and share some of that stuff but i'm going to share my screen now and see what everybody's writing. So um, i'm just going to organize these a little bit and move them around so we can see everything. I see um, uh, install a pollinator plot. That's a great conservation project. So um, hopefully that that's probably going to start with some early successional habitat. Um, eradicate invasive Japanese wisteria in the canopy. Okay, so we got um, so we got a forest canopy with some Japanese wisteria, and oh boy, that stuff can really really take over. Despite the fact that the flowers are very beautiful. Um, you got create a pollinator garden using native plants. Awesome. Um, a lot of our, our native insects require very specific species. Oh, I love it. There's there's tons more popping up here. Um, so let's see. We've got management goal to keep my woodlands healthy. So that that's one of those ones like, um, you know, when you when you start really thinking about what you want to manage for, um, starting out with a broad overarching goal is very important um, but it is just a place to start because when it comes down to what practice are you going to do on your land to actually meet that goal you need to drill down and get more specific um, so that's kind of like a starting ultimate goal and then you need to have those like smaller goals that sort of chip away at that goal um, and that can be um, something like a particular species. Um, there we go. We've got one. I want to increase turkey and quail habitat. That's that's pretty specific because turkey and quail require that that early successional habitat with a lot of your grasses and forbs um, and maybe some trees, but but really open canopy if you've got trees in there. So that's a really great specific goal. I love it. There's there's tons of stuff here. Um, management goal. Let's see. Keep tree of heaven and sweet gun saplings um, down by by mowing better or more regularly. Awesome. Um, again, that's that's more towards um, keeping that early successional habitat by keeping basically keeping the trees at bay so that you don't end up with that later successional habitat with the, the closed forest. Um, oh, we've got somebody wants to attract whippoorwills to their property. Awesome. Perfect. Very specific. Um, a more general one, improving biodiversity of bird species. Um, really, really great. Um, so, so Chris was talking about uh, creating that multi-level habitat where you've got the understory, the midstory, the canopy. That's a really great way to increase biodiversity because each of those in individual sections of forest well, really provides habitat for a different suite of animals. Um, got a couple more minutes. I might have I might have uh, got a little too excited with two prompts because there's tons of stuff here, but but I love it. Thank you guys for participating. Um, somebody mentioned tackling multiflora rows on their hillside. That's a great, very specific um, practice. So that's something that you can do and and come up with a to do list to uh, to actually manage. Um, let's see, infill pine lumber woodland with mixed hardwoods um, with sustainable harvesting. Awesome. Very specific. Um, actionable goals. All right, we got create good areas for feeding wildlife, and and that's that's pretty broad. So like you know what type of wildlife um, do you want to attract, and what depending on what type of wildlife you want to attract, what what species of plants do you need to provide for them? Um, add more natives to our back forest. 
It's great. Um, absolutely. We can never have too many native species. And of course, diversity is always great. So I see convert pasture to successional stages two and three. Awesome. Pastures usually you got the grassland, but but when you're converting it, um, you really want to add more diversity, right? So native species, native forbs, your wildflowers, um, maybe even some shrubby stuff since um, they mentioned succession stage three. Um, okay, we're, how are we doing on time? I, I want I want you all to tell me when I'm. <laughs> when we're out of time here because this is this is great there's just so much good stuff that people what well, is 2 30 fallon it's 2 30 okay yeah, 2 30. Well, this, <laughs> this board will still be here so you can toy around with it and by all means look at what other people have written and um get ideas uh continue to share and thank you for everybody who posted one or more stickies this is awesome all right so that's uh that can that uh, just to kind of summarize and wrap up our meeting here uh, great information from our speakers. So we'd like to thank our speakers for that. Um, of course, this webinar is recorded, so you can go back and hear some of this again. Uh, if you have a few minutes and want to stay on and ask a few more questions of our presenters, then feel free to type those into the chat and we can do that as well. Uh, please note that we do have an evaluation about this webinar that will come out in your email probably tomorrow. So we would ask you or really much beg you to, to just take a few minutes and fill that evaluation out. That helps us understand the programs or the information that you're looking for, that you wanna know more about, that you wanna hear. So uh, if you just take a few minutes and complete that evaluation and uh, hopefully that will be in your email tomorrow. Uh, do take a look, uh, Chris Mormon had put the links to the um, reference materials about managing for non-native invasive plants, since there was a lot of discussion on stiltgrass, uh, as well as making uh, wildlife friendly pine plantations. So if you have a lot of pine plantations for those, um, that might be a great reference tool for you to check out. All right, well, thank you so much. Don't forget, we'll uh, check your inboxes for information on in-person events for the Piedmont gathering at Shank Forest on November 14th. And otherwise, check us out on our website at www.forestherinc, all one word, dot org. Um, otherwise, thank you so much for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you in the future as well. So uh, we'll just take a minute pause here for those that are still on and uh, maybe get a few more questions in just a second. All right, so uh, Chris and, uh, and maybe Joanne as well, uh, we do have a question about, uh, can you use 70% vinegar on the stilt grass? They were trying to use that instead of Roundup on several of their wheat areas. What are your thoughts or suggestions on that? Chris? I'm not sure why, I don't know. I'm not sure the justification. Um, I. I have no concerns about using Roundup as long as you're following the label, which would mean don't apply it to wet areas, wet soils or standing water. Uh, I'm not sure the, the lethality of vinegar may be worse than Roundup. I don't know. <laughs> I've never heard of that. You, okay, Joanne, you got any thoughts? Um, yeah, I've heard that people have tried to use that I have not personally done it um if you're going to do if you I would recommend maybe a little test area and maybe mix a little dawn soap a surfactant because you want it to stick to the leaves um but I I'm with Chris if if a herbicide is used by the label you know the right place the right time the right amount um, but yeah, give it a try, I guess. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, so, uh, it looks like, uh, Kathy did have a follow-up to that, that they are using Dawn and vinegar. And, um, so I'm, I'm not sure myself, um, as the positives of that or, or how the success of that, I guess. So, um, maybe Kathy has some more information on that. Sorry, we can't really answer that. Um, so we do have another question on the best way to control privet and kudzu. Um, so I'm not sure if anybody out there wants to take a stab. I could get off from my thoughts, but uh, 
Oh, yeah, so Kathy says good success with their small plots. Um, just uh, so I got a separate question directly to me about privet. It's probably Chinese privet, which is a can be super prominent in the understory of our coastal plain forest. And, you know, it's just sort of, is that a problem? I, so invasive plants are, they can be sort of a crux because they do often provide food and cover for wildlife. Chinese privet does provide substantial amounts of berry or fleshy fruit resources for birds in the winter time when other foods may not be widely available. Hence, it's spread so easily by birds as they distribute the seeds. So it also provides cover for many animals. If you're ever looking for woodcock in the winter in North Carolina, a privet patch is a great place to find an American woodcock. But um, conversely, privet has uh, sort of ecological strategies that limit the herbaceous layer under it. It casts heavy shade, it's semi evergreen. I think it has uh, specific eco engineering um, components of its leaf litter that limits the regeneration of other plants. So it can create a very simple plant community that doesn't have a lot of diversity. So it's a problem in, th in that sense. Yes, you can kill it. Um, because it's a heavy woody plant, you're either going to have to spray the foliage, the foliage with herbicides, or you're going to have to cut it down and spray the stumps with herbicides. I'm not an expert on any of that. Uh, I would recommend folks look at the guide I posted, and it has really good resources. And if you, um, if that's not enough, there are uh, you contact your county extension office or contact an agency person with with some of those other resources that were listed by Joanne specifically, I think, and those people can really help you out. So that's my general sort of take home message. Maybe the other speakers have some specifics. I just want to add a couple of things. One timing of, any, if you're going to use a herbicide, timing is so critical um, for woody species. Um, I've, I've recommended, um, I've worked with landowners, I, um, in Ohio. Um, and if you want to look at the physiology of those woody plants, you can, I would say, and if you want to minimize the amount of, of product you're using, cut down the privet and do a stump treatment, but in the late summer or fall, because that chemical is going to get translocated down into the roots and then it will prevent uh, increase the um, effectiveness of the uh, treatment. You'll have less sprouting and you'll use less um, pro um, chemicals and less chance of offspring. If you were to do a foliar spray, you know, you could have drift um, and you could also impact some more desirable plants that are, are nearby. And don't do it if you've had an extended drought. That's another thing that's really important with herbicide treatments. Um, the plants aren't as active physiologically and you won't, um, they may not take it up uh, as quickly. Yes, definitely great advice, Joanne, for sure. Um, hey, I Jennifer, can I make a broad statement? Yes, go ahead. Not, not about invasive plants, a little bit about invasive plants, but um, I, I would just encourage the landowners here to think about as, they, as they're trying to manipulate their plant community, either for goals specific to plants or for indirect goals to wildlife. Think about manipulating the plant community that's there and not always about planting, because in a lot of cases, there's a seed bank that's just waiting to be released via light or prescribed burning, which is going to, the prescribed burning is going to ma manipulate the seed bed and the leaf litter layer. And one thing that I worry about, and John Eisenhower and I have discussed this, is that we plant, especially in these young, these early successional meadow communities. And I think over time, that plant community is probably going to revert back to what the seed bank would do anyway. Mm -hmm. So we may be able to complement that community with what we plant. Certainly we do in the short term because we've seen some beautiful pictures, but I just wonder over the long term if we're not going to end up in the same place anyway. And these fallow communities that come from the seed bank can 
can be super beneficial to wildlife in the similar ways to these planted communities. Um, but I don't want to discourage anybody from converting tall fescue because it's, it's not a great plant for wildlife. So yeah, get rid of your tall fescue and either plant something or let the seed bank take over. Yes, definitely. Um, uh, to go back to that question about uh, privet and kudzu, um, some other things, um, of course, as everyone's talked about herbicide, but specific herbicide, timing of the herbicide, um, can do great things. And, and if it, if by one or two, usually does take three applications to control some of these invasive species like privet and kudzu that uh, Cindy had asked about. Um, but if you can control that and then monitor it or try to maintain it to kind of keep it low and small in one location, that does help. That goes, that goes really far. Um, other ways, you know, kudzu, we've got some folks out there that use goats and have success with that. Um, so those are uh, alternative methods to herbicide. Uh, privet is one of those that, uh, like Chris said, birds love it and it spreads quickly. Uh, we've even got a landowner we just did a prescribed burn for this past winter and the entire understory was nothing but privet. Um, we'll, we'll see what kind of grows back because sometimes burning can kill the seed that is in there if we get it hot enough and can kill or control the, the green stems that are above the ground but uh, burning can also make things uh, mad <laughs> or you know, produces enough phosphorus to those plants that something that they were missing or needed and it actually encourages them to grow back. So, uh, so different ways, but uh, talk with your professional, look to some folks, your wildlife uh, biologists, your, your foresters and, uh, and look at what your particular case may be. Um, any other thoughts or, or questions out there from folks? It looks like we still have a, about 65 people still, still around. So if you have some questions that our speakers can ask, they, they, they'd love to, to talk with you or things that they can answer for you. I think Kathy, you're gonna have to show us some, some pictures of your, uh, your success with your stilt grass because that's always something folks are looking for. Definitely a, a troublesome weed. Hey, hey, Jennifer, I wanted to really quick make a comment about um, the question regarding vinegar and, and kind of to add a little bit more to what Chris was saying about um, uh, herbicides sort of being pretty much good as long as they're used according to the label, which, which is the law. Um, you have to use any kind of registered pesticide directly according to the label. And if you use it in any way that's not according to the label, that, that does break the law. But something to keep in mind about those pesticides is that they have been tested and vetted and, and they've gone through rig a rigorous approval process, both, both federally and in each state that they're legal to use. Um, so I know that there are people who really want to avoid using pesticides because they kind of have this bad name and, and um, some people really want to go towards, you know, organic or avoiding chemicals. But in the end, even those, those chemicals that you can get over the counter, um, if they're not registered, it's because they have not been vetted. And in some cases, they can be far more damaging than registered pesticides that have a very particular use and have been deemed to be safe for that use. So for example, I hear people talk about using vinegar or even salt, putting salt mm -hmm. on the soil to use as, a, as an herbicide. And you know, the reason why that's not sold as an herbicide is because it's really, really terrible. <laughs> it's, it would never get approved for you. So, so keep that in mind. You know, if it is a registered pesticide for a particular use, it has been vetted. So um, they are, they're pretty much okay to use as long as they're used by the label. And sometimes um, those over-the-counter or, um, you know, other products that you, you hear about people using can be far worse. So that, my little spiel, I'm going to get off my post uh, or soapbox and thank you for listening. <laughs> <laughs> no, those are great points. Those are, those are great points, Fallon, for sure. Um, I know folks are always concerned about herbicides on their property, but um, we're talking small doses in many cases. Of small areas, um, looking at the plants that we're trying to target. And uh, so there's a lot of things that come into play and in working with someone that, or finding that person that can really, is coming out to your property and looking at your problem and saying, hey, here's a recommendation I would make. 
um, is very helpful. And that's where maybe talking with some other professionals too, or um, if, if obviously if you've been having some success with uh, something else, then um, that's helped you. But, uh, but yeah, so it's a great conversation there. Um, I don't really see any more comments. Any other comments anyone has about uh, I know Deanna did post the evaluation link in our chat box. Um, hopefully that will also go back out to all our participants and email tomorrow as well. And, um, and then the two links that Chris had posted, that um, invasive species link that talks about management and control that the US Forest Service had put out is a great publication, uh, has some great information in there about multiple invasive species, grasses, um, woody plants. So uh, some great information there. So I encourage everyone to check that out. It's kind of the thing as a forester, we kind of revert back to first <laughs> to talk about uh, some invasive plants. Uh, but I'm not seeing any other questions. So uh, if no one has any other comments or, or questions or thoughts for the group, then um, I guess we can wrap this up. Any other thoughts, speakers, suggestions? Last comments? <laughs> all right. Well, thank you uh, to Chris for coming and joining us today and sharing all your information. And thank you to all three of your land, our landowners, Joanne, Michelle, and Patricia. You ladies rock, and you've got some interesting projects going on. And thank you so much for that. And Fallon, that was a great exercise. So uh, I think we got a lot, of, a lot of feedback from there. So that was good, trying to be a little more interactive through the computer here is hard, but uh, but that's definitely a great start. So that was that was good to see. So, uh, all right. Well, if there's no further comments or questions, then uh, thank you everyone for joining us today, and and uh, we look forward to seeing you again in December, or at the Piedmont gathering in November 14th in Raleigh if you're up for up for it. All right. Thank you all. Thank you, Bob. <laughs>